morning, guys. Uh, probably we're going to start uh, differently today. I'm gonna, we're going to start with a demo to just to set up the context. Hopefully, the demo gods are on our side today. And based on that, we'll try to explore how we did this, what are the technologies and open source technologies and API we use to, to realize that demo. Yeah, let's get started. So I have a Raspberry Pi over here. Sorry, I have a Raspberry Pi over here with a small mic, and I'm going to, what we're trying to mimic is a small speech-based home automation where you can control your home devices over the speech. Um, so we used a bunch, uh, we used Raspberry Pi as a cheap mic over the Amazon, bought it over the Amazon, and run it through some of the cloud services. That's that helps us to achieve that goal. Yeah, let's give it a try. Hey Watson, turn on the light. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, that's the gist. Hey Watson, turn off the light. So yeah, this is uh, this is what we're trying to show. But at the end, we'll do some more demos. What other media channel we can use? At the end, we'll do some more demos with using different media channel. Yeah, let's get started. Uh, my name is Prashant Kanal, and I have my colleague over here, Kalonji. We are software engineer with the IBM Watson and Cloud team, and we do a bit of uh, we work with the Watson team as well as we are the dev advocates and engineer uh, in the Cloud and Watson team. Yeah, let's get started and talk about what did we use and how did we realize this demo using some of the SaaS products and the Open APIs. So this is, the, this is the overall architecture looks like for us. I mean, it looks complicated, but it's not really. It's not really. It's on the far left side, we, have, uh, we are trying to mimic some of the devices with speech control and mic audio, mic interface, whether it's a Raspberry Pi or your mobile phone or an Arduino or even like some other embedded um, devices it could be chip. For this demo, we've been using uh, Raspberry Pi. So the speech that we, I just demonstrated over there uh, the speech is recorded and sent it over to the, some of our the serverless platforms that we, we've been using. We're going to talk more about why we chose serverless platforms and how serverless platforms has helped us to really get things going pretty fast. So we have a bunch of, um, we call it a serverless action, just our code that's been hosted on the serverless platform. We composed uh, multiple serverless actions together to achieve our goal. So on this side, this this um, this serverless action basically takes in the audio and transcribes that audio into, this, into the text using the speech-to-text technologies. And that's, the output of that serverless action is feed into another serverless action, which runs that text through the natural language classifier to get the intent from the text. We'll talk in detail about what natural language classifier we used and how did we achieve that. And through that, we just run through a small serverless action that's, that is able to use the NoSQL DV to, to map the device to the device ID and being able to control that device using the MQTT broker, in this case, is the uh, Watson IoT platform. Uh, we used uh, IoT Gateway, in this case, uh, we used, the IoT Gateway we used is it's just a Raspberry Pi in order to provide the IP connectivity to all of these small devices. For example, over here, we're using the light bulb. So this is kind of like the overall architecture about how we achieved this uh, demo. In the next uh, 15, 20 minutes, we're going to talk in detail about um, uh, individual component of these architectures. And we're going to start with this, uh, what, the serverless architecture, what serverless platform we used, and what is serverless, and how we use serverless to compose multiple actions together. Uh, on that, uh, for that, I'm going to hand over the mic to Kalonzi. Hey, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so my name is Kalanji Bancoli. Um, yeah, so I'm going to start out by essentially setting the stage for exactly how uh, serverless uh, architectures can uh, make the day-to-day -day developer options a lot easier. Um, so let's say that you're a developer that uh, comes out with a perfect app idea. So after solidifying the idea, you might spend a good amount of time actually like writing the actual application code and then finally get a prototype up and running. 
Uh, so of course, if you want to actually like share the prototype and allow for others to be able to consume the application and give you feedback, then you'll need to set up a server and uh, place your code there. So let's say that you put the code on the server and uh, send some friends the link to the beta. So after the first week, uh, issue, issue might happen, like your hard drive might crash, and then after you fix that, then a new Linux vulnerability might come out. Um, so you as the developer are spending the majority of your time like actually firefighting and you're fixing like all these other uh, DevOps issues that instead of actually like focusing on the actual code and um, you know like responding to feedback, adding features and so on. So essentially this serverless model allows for users to not um, have to deal with like manually maintaining day-to-day -day operations such as these hardware crashes and um, scaling, updates, networking issues, and so on. Uh, so these ultimately allow for the user to just focus on their code base. Um, so the idea here, the way that serverless works is uh, the developer writes a series of stateless decoupled functions and up uploads them to some serverless engine. Uh, so once they're uploaded, then the function can be called by um, either HTTP request or a change and a service. Um, so these, these services can be anything like a database, uh, changes in social networking, and so on. Um, so the term serverless isn't entirely accurate because the servers still exist and they need to be maintained by somebody. So like many of my colleagues uh, prefer the term function as a service. So that, yeah, the idea is again, like the user just does not have to deal with uh, maintaining the servers and keeping them up. Uh, so there are, there were similar offerings that have been out for a few years called uh, platforms as a service. So you might have heard of uh, Cloud Foundry or Heroku. Uh, so these essentially allow for something similar. Um, a user sends off their entire code base and the platform as a service uh, handles all the dependencies, uh, scaling, and hosting. So the primary difference here is that the platform as a service, it, once it deploys the application, it's always up and it's idle and it's waiting for requests and always um, essentially like charging your account for that uptime. Um, so the difference here is that serverless allow allows us to spin up uh, portions of the application on demand um, in ephemeral containers. So this allows us to actually follow the microservices approach. And um, you only get charged based on how long the uh, actual code is running. And um, so the idea is that uh, each piece of the application is spun up in ephemeral containers and that uh, runs the code, sends the response, and then gets deleted afterwards. Um, so IBM is actually not the only company uh, offering serverless platforms. Uh, there's also AWS Lambda, uh, Google Functions, and I think Azure Functions is the last one. Uh, but ours currently is the only open source one, so you can actually like spin it up and run it at home or in your own data center. So uh, there are essentially four pieces to open with. Uh, so we have triggers, actions, rules, and packages. So I'll explain what each are. So a trigger uh, essentially defines which events open with uh, should pay attention to. So a trigger can be essentially anything. So this can be a webhook. Uh, these can be like updates or changes to a database, uh, incoming tweets to your social media media account or um, change the hashtags, um, data coming in from IoT devices, uh, messages coming in to a certain MQTT channel, and so on. And you can also create uh, trigger, custom triggers as needed. So the main thing that the developer will ultimately want to focus on is uh, implementing the logic that responds to these triggers. So they can do so by creating actions, and these actions are just essentially functions or uh, snippets of code that can be uploaded to the open list action pool. So at the bottom, this is what a very simple hello world action would look like. Uh, so essentially this is just, again, some code that would be placed into a file or into the UI, and then that would be uh, uploaded to the action pool using the WIST CLI. And there's quite a few languages that we support so far. Uh, so it's Node, Python, Swift, and we're in the process of adding more as they're requested. Um, and by the way, Swift is actually like an open source language that was released from Apple about a year ago, so it's becoming uh, pretty popular 
and it's pretty easy to pick up and it works on the front end and the back end. Um, and anyway, so yeah, so the action code is just executed in the Docker container and the result is returned to the user or it's forwarded to another action. So that's called chaining. Oh uh, yeah, so uh, essentially like actions can just be, uh, they can be chained together and executed in a sequence and so that you can actually like reuse pieces of code and combine them according to the needs of your application. So this allows for people to uh, develop their application in a loosely coupled fashion. Okay, so next we have roles. So roles essentially tie everything together. So they define the relationship between triggers and actions. So given the right set of roles, you can have a single trigger uh, kicking off multiple actions or you can have the same action being triggered by multiple roles. It's very flexible. So for example, if you have an application that acts as a security system, you might want to uh, place sensors all on the doors or windows so that when the system is armed, uh, you'd set up rules to say if any triggers go off, uh, take some action by texting these phone numbers. And um, also if you want a trigger to kick off some number of actions in parallel, um, so for example, in the same scenario, you could say when the alarm is kicked off, uh, call actions to uh, lock the doors, flashlights, a start a siren, and so on. Uh, finally, so actions and triggers can be uh, bundled up into packages that can actually be shared uh, using the OpenWisk. So they can either be private or they can be shared using the OpenWisk catalog. So you can use these uh, bundles internally or you can choose to pub publish them publicly to uh, share with all other WISC users. So now that we have these uh, basic concepts down, let's see how everything uh, comes together. So the execution model starts with an event being uh, picked up by the system. So the event trigger should have some role associated with it dictating exactly which action will be kicked off. And uh, based on the relevant rules, uh, some pieces of code should be pulled from the internal action WISP pull and then uh, called from there in response to the request. Uh, so yeah, um, these actions are called and then executed in a temporary Docker container. Uh, so the idea is that the code just uh, runs, returns a response, and then gets deleted. So the way that OpenWiz works is uh, each function that is submitted to the system uh, gets associated with a uh, customized uh, REST endpoint. So you can invoke a function directly by uh, performing HTTP requests. So this can be emitted by an, essentially any device that has internet connectivity. So whether that's a sensor, uh, your phone, laptop, a smart TV, uh, whatever, as, as long as it's connected to the internet. And as an alternative to uh, HTTP REST requests, we can also uh, use something called feeds. And so feeds essentially monitor uh, services such as a database or a message bus like MQTT. Um, and so essentially, if a message comes in to a certain topic, on an MQTT broker, our new record is added to a database. Um, the action can be triggered in response to these changes. Uh, so finally, if a developer would uh, prefer to write these actions in a different language that we don't support yet, they can do so by placing the code in a Docker image uh, and building that and uploading the image to um, our hosted OpenWest offering. Uh, so as long as the container spawned by the Docker image follows a uh, specific API, uh, the custom code should be able to be called just like any other built-in action. Okay, I think I'm gonna go on and, so I'll go on and pass this on to Prashant now. Oh, okay, sorry. So I'm just gonna briefly show you the OpenWIS UI. Uh, so essentially uh, what we're showing here is um, these are, this is how you can like actually see and update the actions. Uh, so you can either do it like through the CLI or, or this UI. And then you can actually um, string these actions together in sequences. 
And also here is a list of uh, some of the public packages that you can uh, pull into and associate with your account. Okay. For example, of our demo, we used the Watson speech to text packets. We didn't really build any. And we tried to chain that with other our small actions together to like uh, chain the Watson speech to text packets with the uh, natural language classifier action so that and also along with the parser to to compose multiple actions and get our work get the get the classification result that's what we used here cool oh, sorry. thanks Kwanzi so yeah let's Let's go back to an architecture and take a look at it briefly, and we'll come back here. So what we just saw over here through what Colonzo described was we use multiple serverless action and chain them together in a sequence. And as each and every action has their own, has their own logic to run like a Watson speech to text, just transcribe the speech to text. Natural language classifier, we'll talk about it later. It's just going to get the classification result out of that natural text so that we could know the intent of the text, what device is trying to control, and what sort of control command it's trying to send. So we're going to take a look at it in detail. So all these actions, states, once we figure out the state, we're using a NoSQL DV to, to update the state of the device in, I mean, corresponding to the document of that device in the NoSQL DV. That changes triggers another OpenWhisk action that, that is being run through the MQTT broker to control the device through IoT Gateway. We, still, we, we have the other piece as well, like I have Triple T. Uh, that is, um, that is the, these are the free web services that's out there in the market. We'll talk about in detail later how, we, how this architecture can, in, in operate, inter, can easily interoperate with these uh, open web services that, that's out there in the world. So yeah, let's go back to the IBM Watson platform. So the IBM Watson uh, platform provides, uh, it's, it's, it's just a, it's a SaaS product. Um, we can even call it a cognitive technology as a service. Um, some of the cognitive technologies that we used for the demo is um, speech-to-text um, service, natural language classifier service, and it has other, other cognitive services that, that's, um, that you can leverage to build a cognitive applications, for example. Um, it has a machine learning as a service as well that to run your own machine learning model. It has a visual recognition service that you can use to classify the, to classify the objects in the image for your business need. And all of these services are, are configurable to run on your own training model and on your own um, training data to get the context as per your business. So it's just an open APIs. It has provided a bunch of um, HTTP-based REST APIs to consume the services. In, other, in some cases, like in, for the context of speech-to-text, it has a streaming API over WebSocket as well to, use, um, to transcribe the stream of audio if, you, if that is more suited for your business need. And it just, in general, it enables developers to integrate cognition in apps and products, whether it's in mobile application or the web application, or even on the embedded devices. Uh, let's talk about the Watson speech-to-text platform that we used. Uh, it's just an API. It has an open API, both HTTP-based or WebSocket-based, to, um, to transcribe speech into text. Um, it's, right now, it supports eight languages, and it also supports your custom, custom model and custom corpus to to give, you to give the context uh, for the transcription. And was, there's a simple example of how you can easily lever leverage this uh, speech-to-text service over HTTP. I can, I just, as you can see over here, you're just using a simple curl command to send a post request. And you're sending an audio file to the speech-to-text service. And it's able to transcribe that speech and gives you back the result with the confidence. Um, Moving on to the natural language classifier, um, 
the, the process of building a natural language classifier and using the natural language classifier service would be to come up with your training model to train the natural language classifier to, with, the, with the anticipated natural text that you would expect from the user um, on your application and, and being able to classify each of those texts with the intent called classes. And once you train with enough data, you can run the natural language classifier from the user text and it gives you the classes uh, for that text. And based on those classes and intents, you could figure out what the user is really intent to say in the natural language, in natural text. So this is kind of like a simple uh, training, training data would looks like on the dashboard. Uh, you can even automate all this training process through the REST API and CLI. Just for, for simplicity, I'm just showing you, can, you have a dashboard to play with it as well. So as you can see, I've defined a bunch of classes over here. These are like a bunch of off and on. These are the devices, fan and light. And it's like an intent of the text. Is it like trying to query the state of the device or is it trying to send a command to the device? So these are the classes, predefined classes I created. And I added some training data, like the text I would anticipate from the user. And for each text, I am specifying what classes it would belong to. And so once you do the training, you can go on and, uh, you can go on and test your classifier with some of the text and see are you really getting the intended classes or not. Like for example, like once you do the training, you want to, when you run with some of the text, you, these, are the, these are the things, these are the classes you get. I mean, these classes are different from what I showed over here, but this is totally configurable based on how you train and what sort of classes you use to train the data. So for example, for the text turn on the fan in the living room, I'm getting the classes saying that, hey, it's a command, it's trying to say it's on, and it's trying to say that it's a living room fan. So that's the sort of the classification. So this classification helps us to figure out the intent of the text, and you can use this JSON-based response to, um, to figure out what device it is, what sort of command is trying to send to the device, and what confidence it is. And you can easily use those to to now communicate to the device. So for communication purpose, we use the Watson IoT platform, which is internally just an MQTT broker. You can in fact, don't have to even, you can even use any um, open source MQTT broker, run it and you should, it's, 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 since it is compatible with the MQTT uh, protocol, you can easily leverage any MQTT broker if uh, you wanna use some lightweight broker, but yeah. What's an IoT platform internally is an MQTT broker. It, it just it provides the REST APIs as well as the real-time APIs to communicate with your devices and also to consume the data of the devices. And mostly we're using here to communicate with the devices, but it can be easily extended to, to read the state of the devices and also communicate that state um, and store that uh, device events. It's, it's, it has what's an IoT platform on top of the MQTT broker. It provides some of the cognitive capabilities, such as you can run your analytics, but for the purpose of the demo, we just use the MQTT broker, and it can be extended to use um, any features. So I briefly showed you about the IFTTT in the, in the architecture diagram. So are you guys familiar with IFTTT? It's great. So it's, it's just a, like a bunch of open web services. Um, it, we, it has a concept of recipes, you call it an applet. So it, has, it is a combination of trigger and action to trigger an action that you can use to control your um, devices or control your web services. So it is not really limited to uh, I, IoT only. It has a lot of IoT channel and there's a lot of vendors out there. They are pushing their um, services out into the IF Triple T service um, service cloud with a recipe to control their to control their appliances like a LG um, washer dryer, LG Freeze, Samsung. Even though there are like a lot of coffee makers, so you can you can use a lot of the uh, web-based triggers. Like for example, if I receive a tweet that says "shut down the fan," and you can even that you can use that trigger to connect to the to the, to the vendor devices uh, that is already being um, registered in the IFTTT services. Uh, for, for the purpose of, the, of our, I mean, we, we are looking into some of, the, some of the use cases. For the purpose of the, our demo, what we, what we did was like we used the Wemo switch 
that has a, a IF triple two services, and you can we put the light bulb uh, connect the light bulb to the Wemo switch, and using the maker channel that allows you to trigger those actions through the web request. Um, I can show it later on, uh, just on the on the IF triple two side. So it's it it's just a way to show that how you can easily interoperate with the other 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 actions and services that's out there that is already being provided by a lot of vendors in their devices. So since using the maker channel, you can easily control those, uh, you can easily trigger the actions on those services connected to the devices through the HTTP base. So it's e really easy to extend your architecture to connect to a lot of those IFTT connected devices. Um, let's see if I can. Let's see. I don't know if I can show you the. Bear with me. Do you know I can? So if you can take a look at all these IFTT connected services and the devices it supports, it has a lot of GE appliances, cooking appliances, dishwasher, dryer. These all now can be controlled through the bunch of actions that you can integrate with it. One of these is a maker channel. So if you use a maker IoT channel and hook that maker IoT channel with any of these devices, now you can easily control these devices over through the HTTP request. That's kind of like what we leveraged for our day. Uh, for the IoT, uh, one example would be: let's go in, and these are like a, we call it a applets and recipes. They call it like uh, it can even track in Evernote every time you leave the for freeze door open. So it's like it's this div it's a device you can connect with the Evernote service to really anytime the freeze door is open, you can you can send that you can track a note of that, and then you can even receive a notification through any channel, even to your mobile application. So, so it's because of, the, because of the open APIs and web services, which can be controlled over HTTP, these are really inter, interoperable with your architectures. Okay. All right. So, so back to let's go back to and do a quick demo. Uh, before that, uh, let's go back to the architecture. So, so far our architecture, we kind of explained what we did and how we use the IoT gateway to provide IoT connectivity. Let's do a quick demo to easily show how you can really extend this architecture to work with any media channel that gives you text, such as SMS over the Twilio or any messenger uh, API. So, so this action, we know that is already takes the text and run the text through a natural language classifier so let's leverage that, how we can easily extend this um, architecture to use, to, to directly send the, use the media channels such as Twilio for SMS text and being able to control the devices using this uh, already created architecture. Yeah, let's, let's give it a try. Uh, Yeah, anyone can try this. I mean, if you guys can try to send these commands or on this phone number and text messages, it's like this. For now, we're just supporting only the light, one device light and on and off command. If you try to send one of these uh, commands to turn on the light in that text, in that phone number, it should, it should, be, it should be able to, you can, should be able to control the device.
So yeah, this is kind of like a showing how you can easily extend the architecture and all those classifier to use with multiple media channel. In this case, we just leveraged SMS text. So yeah, this, this the whole goal of the demo. Yeah, it's gonna be fun. <laughs> The whole goal of this demo, we were, we were trying to discuss, the talk with you guys, the technical recipes that we use to build, um, just by leveraging all these SaaS products out there to build this um, Google Home or Amazon Alexa-like miniature form of those, uh, those appliances. You can easily build something using, um, using those architectures. So yeah, this is kind of like a technical recipe that we came up with. Um, and yeah, with that, uh, Probably I'll leave the, in the time left. We have a lot of time left to, for questions. If you guys have any open questions, I'll be happy to accept it. Yeah. Yeah, there are some, uh, I would, we haven't really, turn the numbers on those yet. We're just trying to get the end-to-end -end functionality working, to be honest, because um, we are mostly, even for the speech-to-text, we are not really leveraging any, um, any streaming capabilities. We're just recording the text, saving it to the file, and sending that file. So using the HTTP, maybe one way to we can minimize that would be using a streaming capability. But we still, we, we haven't really turned the numbers on this, but yeah, it's definitely going through multiple hops, multiple actions. So may not be the right architecture for the time critical data, like you are worried about the nanoseconds latency, you're like a data is coming in the stream of like a, maybe thousand of messages per second, you wanna immediately process this message. There might be a better approach to handle those architecture rather than using a even best serverless, but for our cases, you're just speaking over the mic, you, uh, you probably, you're not expecting result immediately, like in, in a seconds. but yeah, you wanna make it as fast as possible. But on the contrary, maybe, we haven't really played with numbers, but I think there's a room for improvement, in this case, I would say. Uh, say that again. Sorry. Do you isn't if this then that kind of overkill in some ways? Uh, couldn't you have done everything really? You could. Uh, we haven't really used if this and that for this demo. Actually, we kind of sort if this then that is for the cases. That's already there is uh, already an action recipe out there. You like a buy a home appliances from LG Fridge, like, or you have a coffee maker that supports if this, if this, then that services. It's just we're trying to so you can use this architecture to interoperate those with such services. Yeah, we haven't really used if this and that for this. It's, it's solely through the open risk actions. Yeah, that's a good point. Any other question? Um, it's a it's just a first in first come first serve right now. I don't think we have really worked on really thought about like handing multiple users to connect to all devices. I think the, who, it's a first come first serve. Like a, any any command that comes in first, it's just a pretty single and single data pipeline. And I think for the open whisk, maybe Colonzi can explain if there are like multiple requests to the open whisk action. I think it just spins up multiple multiple actions, so in that case, you, you might wanna, if that is the requirement, but mostly this architecture is for like some of the fire and forget scenario, like probably you wanna streamline event based, you wanna streamline some action based on the events you receive. So the order in which you receive the event, that's how your action is executed. So um, internally there's no, we haven't used any synchronization mechanism. Mm -hmm. also, how specific have you had to have been for developing this you know, for your commands to really stay in you know, these tech inputs away from certain um, classes in terms of state and what have you? How exclusive have you had to be with that text input? You know? 
Yeah, I think it's, we, like, turn off the light is pretty much equivalent to, like, shut down the light or something. It has been, um, I think it does try to handle those scenarios. I mean, I expect it to, and I think it, it does. I think it probably it depends on, like, the more you train the data, but it's, I think it should be able to handle those scenarios the way it does. And, I mean, it tried to do the relationship extraction and entity extractions on those texts, and, yeah, it should be able to handle it. The other challenge only we could feel was um, like coming with the training data, like how you scale this natural text. Like we are, we have, we are training the NLC saying that turn on the light, turn off the light. So in future, add, you add one more devices. Do you go on and train your classifier again, like adding text for each of those devices? So we're looking into that scenario and we're probably working on so like you can apply some sort of entity extraction and tagging so that you don't have to train for each and every device but your natural language classifier is able to extract the entity that you think is a device from those. So those are, the, those are I think, more challenging aspect we would see going forward, like being able to scale with the number of devices and different heterogeneous devices. But so far, in terms of text and intent, it's, it's, it has, it's working pretty well to, to extract the intent. Any, other, any more questions? All right, so we'll be, we'll be roaming around. If you guys have any questions offline, feel free to stop us and ask questions. Thanks, guys.